It seems like a long time ago when I was in fourth grade, but when I was in fourth grade, uh, my family attended a very conservative, independent Baptist church for a year or two after we left the Presbyterian church where we had attended since before I was born. This uh, Baptist church was known as a Bible-believing church. And you knew it as soon as you walked in the door. Everybody, it seemed, carried this very large Schofield King James reference Bible. And it had the finger tabs down the side so you could get to every book of the Bible easier. In Sunday school, we got points and prizes for bringing our Bible to church. And every week we had sword drills to see who could find the verses the fastest. And it seemed like the kids that had the Schofield Bibles with those finger tabs always got it faster than I did. In Boys Stockade, we got badges for learning the books of the Bible and for memorizing important verses. So that was fourth grade. When I was in sixth grade, my family became part of a church um, or actually became part of a group of people that wanted to form a church in our community. And eventually they, that group uh, was able to call a pastor, they organized, and they built a building in a growing community where I lived. And although solidly evangelical, the pastor of this church um, worked very hard to provide a contemporary Christian setting for the number of families who were joining our church. And at this new church, no one seemed to carry the Bible with them. There were RSV Bibles conveniently available for everyone to use in the pews. There were no more sword drills in Sunday school. There were no more prizes for memorized Bible verses, no more points for bringing my Bible. Bibles were never needed in Sunday school because the materials we were using had the Bible printed, passages printed for us. And there was this brand new technology just out called the overhead projector that could <laughs> amazingly put them up on the screen for us. While most evangelical churches at that time still embraced the Bible as the divinely inspired authoritative word of God, and the only infallible rule of faith and practice, the audiovisual media explosion of my generation offered new ways to teach the Bible to children. Ways that were much more interesting and exciting. Ways that were less dependent on the Bible itself being in your lap as you learned. And ways that were certainly a lot more fun than struggling with memorizing King James English. We were concerned in those days about prayer being taken from the schools, while at the same time we did not seem to notice that the Bible was vanishing from our Sunday school. Today it's not uncommon for Sunday school children to go to their Bible-believing churches without a Bible, and if they bring it, there's very little opportunity to need or to use it. Now we're not suggesting that we go back to the Sunday school days of the 50s and 60s, nor are we suggesting that carrying a Bible is a mark of a church or a Sunday school's commitment to the Bible. What we're saying is that if we're serious about teaching the Bible to children, and if we're serious to teaching the God of the Bible to our children, and if we're serious about giving them a biblical vision of God and a biblical view of the world and their culture and a biblical view of their, themselves, then we should give some consideration to the place that the Bible itself has in our home and in our churches and in the children's ministry of the church. If we want the biblical truth to have preeminence in the lives of our children, then it seems that giving the Bible prominence in our homes and classrooms would help to serve that vision. Paul tells us, in 2 Timothy, he tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.15 of his early training in the scriptures. He says to Timothy, from childhood, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation 
through faith in Christ Jesus. Paul emphasizes in Romans 10, 17, Paul says God saves people through his word. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Since faith is what, it comes from hearing the word of God, it follows that one of our primary goals in cooperating with the work of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of the next generation is to immerse our children in the word, to saturate them with the Bible. Now, when I talk about Bible-saturated children, there's an image that comes to mind, and that's the image of a sponge. And just as a sponge immersed in water is saturated with the water, so we want to immerse our children into the word of God that they be saturated by it. Now, there is, it is important to know that for this to work, it has to be sponge-like material. You can't take a rock, and even if you stick a rock into water, it's not going to be saturated with water because it's hard and it can't absorb. So this gets back to the gospel work that has to do with our, the hearts of our children need to be soft, need to be absorbent. But as God's doing that work, we need to immerse them into the word of God. Bible-saturated people drip Bible. The word of God begins to color our conversations and our counsel. The word of God begins to shape the ways we think and the ways that we behave. Our desires and our outlook become biblically shaped. All through the work, all through the work of God's grace in our hearts, and um, as we absorb his word, the Bible is influencing that work. Everything we observe, everything we are taught, all the opinions we consider, all the decisions that we make, all the conclusions that we come to are to be shaped by the word of God. The Bible influences every situation that we face. When we are squeezed by life's problems, what we want is for Bible to come out. When we are pricked by the arrows that Satan sends our way or by other temptations and problems in our life, we want Bible to come out. When we sleep, we want to dream Bible. <laughs> when we pray, out comes Bible. When they speak, we want them to speak Bible verses and let biblical truth permeate their words. When they're afraid, we want the Bible there to give them courage and strength. When they're discouraged, the Bible is there to encourage them and to give them hope. If we are saturated with the word of God, we have an ever-present and infinitely wise counselor and comforter and interpreter to guide us and others through us. So if we are to influence the next generation to be Bible-saturated, we must present them with the whole counsel of God. Again, Paul highlights this concept in his letter to Timothy. From childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. So with that truth in mind, we would like to suggest some basic building blocks for presenting children with the whole counsel of God. While they may be specifically introduced and emphasized at different ages, it is important that they be included in our children's theological education. So we're suggesting story-based chronological approach, a biblical theology, a systematic theology, moral instruction, and explicit gospel presentation. So let's look at the first building block. Our children should have a basic introduction to the entire Bible through a story-based chronological approach. Much of the Bible is written in narrative form, which can present it 
be presented as individual stories. And stories are a wonderful tool for teaching young children. Their minds are geared toward listening to and memorizing information that's presented in story form. Think of the many childhood stories you still remember, even years and years later. Our very young minds committed many of the key characters and events of those stories to memory. By presenting Bible stories to young children, we're taking advantage of this God-given characteristic in young learners. Through a careful presentation of key Bible stories in a God-centered way, the children will start committing to memory important truths about God and his character, as well as acquainting them with other key figures and events. However, it's also important that we present these stories in a chronological manner. A chronological approach helps the children to see and understand that the Bible has a certain order, direction, and progression. For example, God created everything and it was very good. Adam and Eve were the first people. God gave them a command not to eat of the one tree. Adam and Eve disobeyed God's command and sin entered the world. God punished Adam and Eve and death entered the world. This, chron this chronology is important as it reveals the order of events and the cause and effect or the direction and progression of the Bible. Young children need to see these connections. For example, God makes a promise to Abram and Sarai that they would have a son. And later in scripture, we see that God fulfilled his promise by sending them Isaac. Or we see that David the shepherd boy slays the giant Goliath and then later grows up to be King David, God's chosen ruler for his people. The Bible is filled with these connections which are only seen through a chronological approach so that we can see that the God who fulfills his promises is a God who is also unchanging in his character, who always cares for his people who accomplishes his purpose from generation to generation throughout the Bible. In other words, the events of scripture are not simply a series of unrelated information. The Bible has a storyline woven throughout, and this storyline is driven by one main character, namely God. God is the main character throughout so that the children now can clearly understand that ultimately the whole Bible is about God. And as the other characters are introduced, the children see the events unfold. They also see God's interaction with these people and events, and it reveals who God is and what he is like and how people are to respond to him. The Bible is purposely moving in God's direction, not man's, and is progressively revealing God's plan, not our own. The second building block that children need is a biblical theology that focuses on the main storyline of the Bible. After children have been introduced to key Bible stories in a chronological manner, they, need, they now have some important categories for understanding God's character, man's character, and God's interaction with man. But it's also important that they learn that the Bible has a meta-narrative or a big picture that is unfolding through these individual stories. Biblical theology is important for children as it helps them to see the Bible as one complete true story that progressively reveals God's redemptive purposes, which come to their complete fulfillment in the person and work of Christ Jesus. Biblical theology defined as such focuses on the historical redemptive or gospel work of Jesus. It sees the big picture of scripture and examines how then each individual part fits into that bigger picture. For example, children do need to learn the individual stories. God creates the world, Adam and Eve sin. God sends a flood to judge the world but saves Noah and his family. God makes a promise to Abraham. God chooses Jacob. God gives Israel the Ten Commandments. God gives Israel priests. God makes David king over Israel. 
Israel turns away from the one true God. But they also need to learn that all of these stories are pointing in one main direction. They're to pointing toward God and his redemptive purposes as revealed and fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus. This is demonstrated in scripture in Jesus' conversation with the two men on the road to Emmaus, where Jesus says in Luke 24, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So therefore, God creates the world is pointing to the work of Jesus. Adam and Eve's sin points to the need for Jesus. God saves Noah and his family points to the saving work of Jesus. God makes a promise to Abraham points to the promise of blessing the whole world through Jesus. God provides a sacrificial lamb for Abraham points to God's sacrifice of his one and only son. God chooses Jacob points to Jesus making a people for God. God gives Israel the Ten Commandments points to Jesus perfect law keeping. God gives Israel priests and sacrifices, points to Jesus as the one mediator between God and man, accomplished through his sacrificial death. God makes David king over Israel, points to Jesus, king of kings. So is it an overstatement to say that the Bible is all about Jesus and his redemptive work? Colossians 1, 15 to 19 says, He... Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent for in him all the fullness of God was well pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether earth or in heaven making peace by the blood of his cross the past several years there's been a revival of biblical theology in the church and this I think is a good thing the Bible is not a haphazard collection of true stories and narratives nor is the Bible merely a collection of different doctrinal truths. The Bible is one grand, wonderful story. The main message that is progressively revealed and can readily be understood by children. However, knowing the main storyline story of the Bible and the biblical narrative does not, in and of itself, provide us with all the necessary categories that we need for understanding and for interpreting the whole counsel of God. After all, not all of scripture is written in a narrative form. The wisdom literature and epistles would be two examples. Furthermore, some essential biblical doctrines such as the Trinity do not lend themselves to a pure storyline approach. To simply say it's all about Jesus does not adequately defend Trinitarian truth nor does it help us to understand the implications of Paul's commands to the believers in his letters. This is why it is also necessary for children to have a systematic theology. Now, here's a definition from systematic, of systematic theology that we take from Dr. Wayne Gruden's book by that title, Systematic Theology, a book that I hope all of you own and we encourage all of our teachers and small group leaders to have on their shelves. But this is what Grudem defines as systematic theology. It's any study that answers the question, what does the Bible teach us today about any given topic? This definition indicates that systematic theology involves collecting and understanding all relevant passages in the Bible on various topics and then summarizing their teachings clearly so that we know what to believe about each topic. For example, systematic theology will ask the question, what is God like? And then it uses the whole Bible to collect and to understand the relevant passages, and then carefully summarizes those passages to teach us about the character of God. 
A summary might include the following. God is triune. God is eternal. God is almighty. God is love. God is wise. God is holy. God is wrathful. God is faithful, and so on. Why is systematic theology important for children? Several reasons. Think for a moment of the skill of a young child that he acquires when he starts to sort things, putting into bins, certain bins that take like objects, so cars and blocks and plastic animals and sorting those things out into like categories. The child is learning something about things that belong together. There are things that belong together and then there are other things that do not belong together. The brain is learning to sort things out and to create important categories. In this case, different objects, pres, pres, pr, different objects have different categories. The simple illustration, that simple illustration, helps us to understand what systematic theology is and why it's important to children. It provides a structure for them, a structure for understanding foundational doctrines of the Christian faith. We create categories and assign biblical texts to those categories, and then we carefully examine the information in those categories that leads us to doctrinal conclusions and hopefully doctrinal convictions. Throughout the entire Bible, we find information about the character of God on topics such as creation and man and Satan and sin and Jesus and salvation and the church and heaven. Systematic theology provides us with categories for us to sort and to understand these important topics. And as we discover, the and, and then we discover the distinct qualities about each of these categories. This sorting helps children rightly understand each important topic more clearly. Yes, every word of the Bible is in some way describing and demonstrating the character of God. But by putting his chief attributes into distinct categories, children can more easily learn and summarize the basic question, who is God and what is he like? Now, as we do this, a second important lesson or second important reason for systematic theology emerges, and Jill is going to talk about that now. Systematic theology also provides categories that serve to guard against wrong interpretations of topics and specific texts. And here's just a real simple example from 1 John 4.8. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Now taken in and of itself, one might use this text and others like it to infer that God's chief attribute is love. Systematic theology, however, searches all texts concerning God's character. And through this systematic approach, we find God's character is richer and deeper than one isolated attribute. And his love must be seen then and understood through this larger view of his character. A third reason systematic theology is important for our children is it also provides a framework for rightly understanding biblical theology. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, consider, for example, the narrative in Genesis 3, which tells of the fall. If we were pre to present this text in a pure narrative form, without the discipline of systematic theology, it might appear, especially to children, as if God was rather in a huff over one little sin. After all, a kid might think, what's the big deal? Why did God get so mad at them? It was just a piece of fruit. Mom and dad don't get me that mad at me if I steal a cookie out of a cookie jar. Systematic theology, however, gives us the necessary framework of God's character for interpreting that narrative. For example, God is holy, righteous, and just. Therefore, God cannot tolerate sin, even one sin. God cannot swim, 
simply sweep sin under the rug and pretend it isn't there. Sin must be rightly punished in order for God's holiness to be affirmed. When seen in this way, systematic theology provides a framework for rightly understanding the biblical narrative. So, biblical theology, the storyline of the Bible, provides the big picture narrative of the Bible's redemptive, Christ-centered focus, giving children an understanding of the Bible's primary message, and systematic theology provides categories for understanding important doctrines and how each doctrine informs and is revealed in the narrative storyline. A pure storyline approach to the narrative of Genesis 3 does not provide children with a category in which to properly understand God's response to Adam and Eve. As parents and teachers, we should be very careful to examine the resources we use with our children. Do they tend to give children only the storyline approach and disregard or minimize key doctrines? Do they tend to only teach doctrines systematically while ignoring the main storyline of the Bible? Our children need both. Both are foundational for teaching the whole counsel of God. What we have seen lately in a lot of children's Bible literature is an emphasis on biblical theology, the emphasis of the redemptive storyline of the Bible. And it's often written without the framework of a systematic theology, thereby minimizing or compromising true doctrine. Now, because children love stories and remember them, if you're teaching Bible stories without attention to true doctrine, they may retain untrue thinking about who God is for years. By right, teaching rightly who God is and his work of redemption, the faith that children expect express will be faith in the historical Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, not a Jesus of their own invention, because their response will be shaped by truth. They are indeed embracing the work and person of Jesus Christ, son of the living God. The fourth building block of biblical truth is moral instruction. Now, we've asserted thus far that exposing children to the whole counsel of God includes a chronological framework, an understanding of biblical theology, a careful presentation of systematic theology, and finally now, we're going to talk about an exposure to the moral and instructive nature of Scripture. Though we stated in the first session that the main purpose of Bible stories is not to teach good morals, but to reveal the character and work of God, it does not follow that there is no place for moral instruction in teaching our children. Moral instruction is not a relic of the Old Testament. Jesus' one recorded sermon was full of ethical teaching, referring back to and expanding the Old Testament moral instruction. Paul was constantly instructing believers in his church, warning them, admonishing them, guiding them. But sadly, there is a recent trend to ne negate the ethical, instructive nature of the Bible because of the perceived notion that it's not in keeping with the teachings of the gospel. J.C. Ryle, who was the 19th century bishop of Liverpool, rightly asserts, we must be holy because this is one grand end and purpose for which Christ came into the world. Jesus is a complete savior. He does not merely take away from the guilt of a believer's sin, he does more. He breaks its power. And you can see the text in which he cites to um, support that. Kevin DeYoung, in a recent article called The Whole in Our Holiness, says, My fear is that as we rightly celebrate and in some quarters rediscover all that Christ saved us from, we will give little thought and make little effort concerning all that Christ saved us to. In 1 Thessalonians 4, we see that Christ saved us so that we might be sanctified. And it's in our sanctification that we reflect the character of Christ and become more and more like him. Verses 1 to 3. Finally, then, brothers, 
we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God just as you are doing and that you do so more and more for you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus for this is the will of God your sanctification then in Romans 7 Paul says verse 12 Paul shows us the true nature of the law of God the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good and Paul's on here just echoing the Old Testament teaching on moral instruction Deuteronomy 10 12 to 13 now, O Israel, what does the Lord require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and the statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding today for your good. God's moral law is for our good, and it is good. It is a blessing, and those who love and fear the Lord, delight to do God's will, delight to walk in his commands. Psalm 119, 47, For I find my delight in your commands, which I love. John Calvin here is very, very helpful. He talks about three uses that the law has. This is amazing, isn't it? Children's Ministry Conference, we're talking systematic theology. Biblical theology, now John Calvin, good grief. Okay, he's got three uses of the law. The spiritual use, which teaches that the, the, the law accuses us. The law shows us our sin and drives us to seek God's mercy in Christ. God's law is the reflection of his holy and his righteous character, and it reveals the standard that he has set for our holiness. Disobedience to even one command, one time, excludes us from his presence, excludes us from heaven, for the law must be kept perfectly all the time. James 2.10 says, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. Children, must know God's commands. If they are to see that they are sinners who cannot live up to God's righteous demands. Romans 3.20, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. John Piper's been very, very helpful to us here where he says, if we don't know what our real plight is, we may not recognize God's rescue when it comes. The law is meant to drive us to the cross as the only hope that we have as sinners. The second use of the law is to provide a moral foundation. The moral law is a moral foundation for civil government in restraining evil. You know, God has put his moral law in the conscience of all men. So there's an understanding of things like murder is wrong. This is confirmed by God's written commands and gives governments a standard by which to determine right from wrong, what is offensive, punishable behavior. Those standards are very important. Children need to learn those. Even for unsaved children, the law acts as a moral governor for their consciences and a deterrent to deviant behavior. Here's another uh, quote from John Piper. For children, external, unspiritual conformity to God's commanded patterns of behavior is better than external, unspiritual nonconformity to those patterns of behavior. A respectful, mannerly five-year-old unbeliever is better for the world than a more authentic, defiant, disrespectful, ill-mannered, unbelieving bully. The family, the friendships, the church, and the world in general will be thankful for parents that restrain the egocentric impulses of their children and confirm in them every impulse towards courtesy and kindness and respect. The third use of the law then is to teach us and encourage us to pursue holy living. You know, God's moral law is not just an old covenant requirement. The New Testament over and over calls us to obedience to God's moral law, to strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. 
to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness, to let our manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Peter instructs us in uh, 1 Peter 1, 14 to 16, as obedient children do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. A tremendous blessing of the law is that God's commands are not burdensome, but were given for our good. They're a blessing. God has given his moral law to bless us, to lead us in pleasant paths of righteousness and joyful living, to guide us. They should cause us to delight in them. Psalm 119, 129, your testimonies are wonderful. Therefore, my soul keeps them. Read Psalm 119 and see how many times the law is accompanied by delight or love. It's over and over and over, all the way through that psalm. God's ways are wonderful. They lead to life. They protect us from evil and heartache. They guide us in our confusion, giving wisdom and counsel. They show us how to live a God-exalting life and the Christ-like character for which the Christian is to strive in the strength that God supplies. I think a book that's very helpful to parents and to teachers in reproving, correcting, and training children and teaching children using the scriptures is Lou Priolo's book, Teach Them Diligently. I think it's the book every parent and every children's worker should read. So one concern here would be, are we just teaching our children to be little Pharisees? by asking children to conform to certain standards of behavior that do not come from the heart. I don't think so. If we do not give children moral instruction, we're leaving them to blindly follow their own sinful inclinations and withholding from them an understanding of their need for a savior. Again, to quote my colleague John Piper, he says it's better Requiring obedience from children in conformity with God's will confronts them with the meaning of sin in relationship to God, the nature of their own depravity and their need for inner transformation by the power of grace through the gospel of Christ. Paul instructs fathers in Ephesians 6.4 to bring up our children in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. We must teach our children habits of godliness and pray that someday the heart will follow those habits. The heart is often shaped through the expectations that we set for our children and the instructing that we do and the correcting that we do. This is how Puritan pastor Richard Baxter saw the connection between the duty and the affections of the heart. He said, resolve to spend most of your time in thanksgiving and praising God. If you cannot do it with joy, with the joy that you should, yet do it as you can. Doing it as you can is the way to be able to do it better. Thanksgiving stirreth up thankfulness or thanksgiving in the heart. We must pray that in all of our teaching of the word, of God through the story of redemption, through the systematic teaching of Bible doctrine, and through the moral instruction of the word, our children would come to fear the Lord their God and possess an admiration of his character and a love for all of his ways and saving faith. Then they will be able to say with the psalmist, with my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I might walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. And then Psalm 119, 32, I will run in the way of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. So now we've got four basic building blocks for presenting children with the whole counsel of God. But there's a fifth, and that's of utmost importance. It could be said that this building block is the foundation for all the others, but it is in a category all by itself, and Jill will tell us about it. So that fifth category, or building block, children need an explicit presentation of the gospel. Why should this be in a category of its own? 
isn't the purpose of telling Bible stories and giving children a biblical theology and a systematic theology and moral instruction all to point them to the gospel? Yes. All of our teaching should be permeated with gospel truth. However, not every lesson must explicitly present the gospel and explain it. For example, the story of God commanding Abraham to sacrifice Isaac is permeated with essential gospel truths. It is pointing forward to Jesus and his sacrificial death on the cross. It is pointing to the necessity of faith as evidenced in obedience to God. The story is part of the grand narrative of the Bible, but simply tacking on an invitation to accept Jesus or trust in Jesus at the end of the lesson may not do justice to the richness of the gospel. This becomes even more evident as other key stories and doctrines are presented to children. For example, trying to directly tie the gospel in when you're teaching how God delivered Israel from the hands of the Philistines or in teaching the doctrine of the Trinity uh, could prove quite challenging. In other words, it would prove very awkward if week after week a teacher attempts to explicitly try to direct every story or teaching of every doctrine to the gospel. In trying to do this, my fear is that the gospel would become muddled or even trivialized. So therefore, children do need an explicit presentation of the gospel that clearly teaches and summarizing its essential truths. These truths are ones that can be simply explained and memorized by children, providing them with a gospel core necessary for saving faith. Now, we believe this is so important that uh, Children Desiring God has actually created a booklet called Helping Children to Understand the Gospel. And in it, we've identified 10 essential truths that should be presented and explained to children. And quickly, these are, God is the sovereign creator of all things. God created people for his glory. God is holy and righteous. Man is sinful. God is just and is right to punish sin. God is merciful. He is kind to undeserving sinners. Jesus is God's holy and righteous son. God put the punishment of sinners on Jesus. God offers the free gift of salvation to those who repent and believe in Jesus. And then finally, those who trust in Jesus will live to please him and will receive the promise of eternal life, enjoying God forever in heaven. Now, as you can see from these gospel truths, as you can see, these gospel truths in one form or another permeate all of scripture. But by presenting them in a structured and symptomatic manner, the children will be clearly taught the essence of the gospel with the hope that through the work of the Holy Spirit in their heart, they might respond to these truths in belief placing their full confidence in Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins and the hope of eternal life with him. So in summary, we've offered five basic building blocks for presenting children with the whole counsel of God. Story-based chron chronological teaching, particularly in the preschool years, biblical theology, systematic theology, moral instruction, and the explicit presentation of the gospel. Now, this might feel daunting to us as individuals and as teachers, because in order to teach our children these five basic building blocks, we ourselves need to be taught. Uh, John Piper has said, it takes as much or more understanding of a biblical doctrine to teach it to children than it does to teach it to adults. If you understand a thing well, you can usually make it plain for ordinary people and children. But if you are fuzzy in your own understanding, you will generally be overly complex in your explanation. A great hindrance to the salvation and the growth of our children is the weakness of our own grasp of the full range of biblical truth and the unity of the whole counsel of God. I am overwhelmed at what children can absorb and retain when they are repeatedly and systematically 
and progressively instructed in the great doctrines of the Bible. You know, these building blocks should not only be present with our, ch ch <coughs> excuse me, with our children when we sit down with them and read the Bible or teach them a lesson, but also when they get up in the morning, when they go to school, when they play with their friends, as they go through their daily routines. It should be a constant hum in their minds. Now, does this seem unlikely? It is possible. It's possible if they have the word memorized. When I was in sixth grade, I had a teacher that required us to memorize poems. Um, it's a long time since sixth grade, but I still remember Trees by Joyce Kilmer. I think that I shall never see a poem lovely as a tree, a tree that may in summer wear a nest of robins in his hair. I haven't practiced that. I learned it as a child and retained it. My dear husband, however, remembers this. There once was a man, his name was Jed, a poor mountaineer barely kept his family fed. <laughs> then one day he was shooting at some food, and up from the ground come a bubbling crude. Oil, that is. Black gold, Texas tea. Now, come, uh, no. First thing, the first thing you know, old Jed's a millionaire. The kinfolk said, Jed, move away from there. Said California is a place you ought to be. So they loaded up the truck, and they moved to Beverly Hills, that is. Swimming pools, movie stars. Now, come along and visit with the Clampett family as they learn the simple pleasures of the hills of Beverly. And that includes the products of the sponsor of the week, the best to you each morning, right from Battle Creek. Kellogg's puts more in your morning, more flavor, more fun. I see some of you have memorized. Well, for better or for worse, what is memorized in childhood is often retained for a lifetime. Children will memorize. The question is, what do we want them to memorize? What an opportunity we have to saturate the minds of our children with the Word of God by taking advantage of these prime memorization years. One of the reasons that memorization is so important is that it makes meditation on the word possible. Um, Lou Priolo in his book that I recommended, Teach Them Diligently, paraphrases a Puritan preacher named Haywood Oliver. Oliver wrote a book called Heart Treasure, and this is what Lou Priolo says about that. Lack of meditation is the primary reason that so many professing Christians, in spite of exposure to the most excellent teaching, still remain ignorant, unstable, and unfruitful ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Instruction flows in upon them from all sides, but their hearts and minds are like sieves, out of which everything runs as fast as it's poured in. The impressions which truth makes on their minds are as temporary as characters trace in the sands of the seashore, which the next wave erases forever. But meditation imprints truth deeply on the conscience, and engraves it on the tablets of the inner man as with the point of a diamond or laser beam. It thus becomes incorporated into the soul and forms, as it were, a part of it. And it is ever present to regulate the heart's affections and to control and guide all its movements. We all know Psalm 1, 1 to 2, which also uh, commends meditation. Blessed is the man who is walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is on the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. As we meditate in the Bible, we begin to see the beauty of God in his ways, and it changes us. Without Bible memory, we have cut off a means of grace to influence our souls. We have lost the opportunity for meditation. Priolo also goes on to say, meditation fastens into our hearts truths which we received but have not yet assimilated into our character. Meditation is a means of the Spirit of God effectively, uh, that the Spirit of God effectively uses to permanently amalgamate into our character that truth which previously we may have only received intellectually or superficially. Truth that had not yet been digested and become part of our makeup. And in this fast-paced electronic age in which we live, there's very little that encourages us to meditate on anything, much less on the Bible. Our goal is for our children to so memorize the word and to have it on the tip of their tongue that it becomes almost like the hum that's 
running in the background in their minds. It's that which their minds will default to when they kind of go into neutral. And when that happens, we're moving toward being Bible saturated, for being saturated with the word of God. And then we can, when that happens, we can put ourselves then to sleep with the word of God. And in idle, idle moments, we can spend reflecting on the word of God. And when temptation arises, the word of God is right there to help us fight. There's a word of truth or a conviction or a power to help us in fighting the fight of faith. Meditation on the word through Bible memory brings insights we would otherwise have missed. The Holy Spirit does not work in a vacuum. He works through his divinely inspired word. And when a child memorizes scripture, the Holy Spirit brings situations into that child's life that brings understanding to the memorized word and quickens that truth to a child's heart. Here's an example. When our younger daughter, Chrissy, was in preschool, she was learning in Sunday school that God made everything. He made the trees, he made the flowers, he made the bees, he made the birds. God made everything. One day during that period, I was backing out of the driveway with my two daughters in the back seat, and Christy said, God made the house, looking at the house across the street. Well, my older daughter, being five, uh, knew a little more than that, supposedly, and she said, no, God didn't make the house, a man made the house. Well, they continued this debate for a little while, and then I stepped in. I said, you know what, you're both right. A man took a hammer and some nails and, a board and some boards. He pounded those boards together and he made a house. But who gave the man the tree to make the wood? And who gave the man the hands to hold the hammer? And who gave the man the mind to think of making a house? And Christy, at two and a half, three years old, said, every good and perfect gift comes from above. And then simultaneously, simultaneously, they both started seeing God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. That is the work of the Holy Spirit, taking the memorized word, bringing an occasion where it can be applied, and working through his word and power. The memorized word uh, is a blessing to our children. We do not want to withhold from them. The memorized word also provides us with language for prayer and worship. I was in a sixth grade uh, Sunday school class at our church one time, and this, the small group, le this, the worship leader um, had led a song about God being good and the promises of God, the goodness of God. And then he just said, let's just take a few minutes and pray and just pray prayers of praise to God, starting with, God, you are so good because... And what I heard were things like this. God, you are so good because while we were yet sinners, you died for us. God, you are so good because you work all things for good to those who are called according to your purpose. God, you are so good because you did not spare your own son but gave him up to die for us. Over and over what they were praying were Bible verses that they had memorized. It gave them words and expressions of prayer. They offered prayer after prayer. The majority of those thoughts were memorized verses. The memorized verse is accompanied by the power of God. It really is a sword, best wielded when it's in your head as well as in your heart, of course. There are no words of comfort that bring more comfort than the words that are soaked in the word of God. There are no prayers uttered that lead us into the presence of God like Bible-saturated prayers. There is no speech that can touch the human heart like word-saturated speech. There are no words that bring clarity or counsel more than Bible-saturated words. If you are not memorizing scripture, we would earnestly commend it to you. You know, we cannot expect children to memorize and think that it's important and it's a lifetime habit unless we adults do that as well. And one of the resources that we have recently updated to help in Bible memorization is the Fighter Verse program, which is available in the bookstore. So exposure to the whole counsel of God is vital. But in doing that, we must also teach them to understand the Bible rightly. Sometimes we assume too quickly that the Bible is too difficult for most children, especially young children, to really understand. So instead of asking them to pick up a Bible 
Look up verses in the Bible, read them, and to try to figure out what those verses mean, we give them superficial presentations that kind of covers the highlights, often in an entertaining way. By first or second grade, we believe every child should have a Bible. And our Bible sh teaching should consistently give them the opportunity to open up that Bible and to connect with it and to use it. It's our conviction that Jesus that children need to discover biblical truth. Not only do they need to be exposed to it regularly at home and at church, but they also need to learn how to interact with the Bible. They need to be challenged to read it and to think about what they've read. They must be on, go beyond just knowing the stories of the Bible and a few familiar vo verses to really studying the Bible, wrestling with the meaning of the text. Our children and young people need the same encouragement that Paul gave to his spiritual son, Timothy, in 2 Timothy 2.15. Do your best, Timothy, to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Are we helping our children, the next generation, to rightly handle the word of truth? Are we helping them to understand the word of God and to interpret it correctly? Are we in helping them to, are we giving them the necessary tools to be able to do that? In a postmodern culture where it's acceptable to kind of define your own truth, children must realize that truth is not just what I think this verse means or what this verse means to me, but rather truth is found in discovering the author's original intent. We can teach children to make observations of the text, ask questions of the text, and answer those questions. They can do this. It's simple. Here's an example. Philippians 1, 12 to 13. I want you to know, brothers, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that, it, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And we can just start by asking simple questions. Who's speaking or writing? Paul. Who is he writing to? The Christians in Philippi. Where is Paul? Well, if they look at that chapter, they're going to find out he's in jail. It even says in here, he's in prison. Um, what is his, why is he in prison? Well, look at the text. He's in the prison to, because he's preaching the gospel. Look at the whole chapter there. What is his attitude in prison? He's rejoicing. Why is he rejoicing? He's rejoicing because the gospel is being preached. His goal is to make Christ known, and that goal is being served by his imprisonment. All we have to do is make them stop and think about the text. And one of the ways you do that is to ask questions. Simple hermeneutics, simple tools of interpretation are not too difficult for children. Here are a few basic examples. Look at the verse in context. How much wrong interpretation occurs because people isolate Bible verses. We must teach children to look at the verses around a verse as a clue to the correct meaning of the text. That Romans 8.29 interprets the meaning of good, be conformed to the image of his son, in Romans 8.28. Notice figurative language like hyperbole or exaggeration. For example, in Luke 14.26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Did Jesus really say this? The same Jesus who said that we should love our enemies, and if we're angry with our brother, we'll be liable to judgment? Through careful study, a child can discover that Jesus is talking in hyperbole, and that he's showing that the kind of love we should have for him is so great that in comparison, our love for our families looks like hatred. We want to teach them that one of the places you go when you're trying to understand Scripture is to Scripture itself. For example, that text from Luke 14 that Sally just read uh, is, is interpreted by Matthew in chapter 10, verse 37, where he says, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, or whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So scripture helps to illumine other scriptures.
So we want to teach them to think and to think biblically and to think critically so that they understand the text and not fall into wrong thinking or false doctrine. So start with simple questions about text when children are small and then we give them more tools as they mature. Now this is the opposite direction that the culture even in the church seems to be moving as we move from a language based system to of learning to an image base it will be very difficult for children to become serious students of the word if they are feeding on a sound bite technology over exposure to sound bite technology will reap a crop of students who are incapable of serious careful Bible study, who will not be equipped and competent for every good work. Though children won't understand everything that we teach them in the Bible or everything that they will read in the Bible, just as adults don't always understand when they read the word, they will absorb a lot as the Holy Spirit and our clear explanations will guide them in the truth. Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.7, Think over, think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. So Paul's saying, Timothy's thinking, and the Lord is giving understanding. Understanding the Bible comes from careful study of the Bible. Think over what I say implies reflection, study, and time, and from prayerful dependency on the Holy Spirit who gives us this understanding. Another thing we should keep in mind as we're teaching children is the whole concept of precept upon precept. Ted and Margie Tripp have some very wise counsel. They've stated, we give our children big truths they will grow into rather than light explanations they will grow out of. This thought is absolutely crucial when it comes to teaching children the big truths of the Bible. Some people do not believe that young children can possibly learn concepts such as the Trinity or God's sovereign rule over all things or his right judgment on sinners or what justification and sanctification mean. But they can learn these important truths through the power of the Holy Spirit working in conjunction with the word of truth as, as it's being presented step by step, precept upon precept. Now precept upon precept. We're all familiar with the process of learning to read and write. Children learn to read and write in distinct incremental steps. For example, it first starts with babies hearing audible phonetic sounds. Then they start connecting these sounds with people, objects, emotions. Then they connect these sounds with a written script, an alphabet, and words. And as they get older, then they start using letters to construct words and read words and phrases. And then they start reading and writing sentences and paragraphs. And then they learn about grammar and sentence structure. And finally, they start to learn to express complex ideas and are able to analyze and summarize what they read. We could say that reading and writing are taught precept upon precept, step by step. Each new step builds on the previous step with increasing complexity. Each step is introduced at an appropriate age when the mind is ready to master each new skill. Now, this isn't rocket science. This simply reflects the wisdom of God in how he's created the human mind to learn new things. This example of reading and writing can serve us in teaching children the most important truths of all the truths contained in God's words. God's truths are best taught and absorbed if we think in terms of precept upon precept. Now, before we explore how this is specifically done in terms of biblical truth, it may be beneficial for us to look, um, draw upon classical education for an understanding of the levels in the learning process. The first stage is called the grammar stage. In it, you teach information and facts that provide the building blocks of all learning. Second is called the logic stage, where you teach how to analyze and organize information and facts. And then the final stage is the rhetoric stage, where children are taught how to express conclusions. 
So a quick summary of this pattern of education could be as follows. The mind must first be supplied with facts and images, then given the logical tools for organization of those facts and images, and finally equipped to express conclusions. So how does this relate to biblical truth, precept upon precept? Well, let's think first in terms of a child at nursery. He's not yet able to read or write, but he can hear audible sounds. He can begin to hear biblical truth. His young mind can begin to memorize the information. Things like, God is big, God is good, God is strong. In other words, this young child is being given a phonetic alphabet for God, one that will be used as the building blocks for all future truth. At this point, it doesn't matter whether or not the child can truly comprehend these truths. We teach this information regardless, it will be filled in with more meaning later on. And as these truths then are repeated over and over again, and as this vocabulary is expanded through the preschool years, that information is becoming stored away in his brain. So he's learning more now. God made everything. God is the boss. God loves us. God knows everything. God is faithful. He always keeps his promises. We are sinners. God hates sin. Jesus saves us. At this time, as the Bible is used in teaching key chronological Bible stories, for example, the child's Bible alphabet is growing and expanding in its scope, and he's introduced to more and more truths about God. Additionally, he's given that information in sequential manner, so that information is being ordered now in his mind. It is no surprise that at this age in the preschool years and pre-K years, children are taught to put numbers and the alphabet in order. The mind is being prepared to enter the logic stage of learning. So when you enter the logic stage, now the children are ready for more analytical and logical thought. And then we can begin to expand their thinking by not only giving them a chronological approach of information and facts, but also one that connects the individual stories to the whole. In other words, a biblical theology. For example, they can begin to understand that the sin of Adam and Eve eating of the one tree in the garden is connected to Jesus coming to die for sinners. Also, we can begin adding and expanding explaining more complex and abstract truths to his vocabulary. For example, God is Trinity, three persons in one God. God is sovereign, God is almighty, God is holy and righteous. Jesus came to die for sinners. Notice that we are mainly building on truths introduced in the earlier years. So God is big, God is strong, now becomes God is almighty. God is the boss, now becomes God is sovereign. God is right, God hates sin, becomes God is holy and righteous. A holy and righteous God must punish sin. Jesus came to die for sinners. Again, it's a mistake to conclude, even at this stage, that we must only introduce concepts that the child can fully comprehend. When my son was in fourth or fifth grade, he was going through the curriculum, my purpose will stand. And I think even David and Sally were his teachers. And every week I would, when he would come home from class, I would ask him, well, what did you learn? And he would say in a typical 10-year-old boy fashion, all about stuff. Well, what kind of stuff? All about God, you know, and you're just shaking your head. He had a good teacher and a good curriculum. Well, months later, it was very cold out in Minnesota, surprise, surprise. And there was a stray cat out in the backyard that was, looked very cold and shivery. So my son came running into the house saying, Mom, Mom, there's this cat, he's cold. You know, can I have a black blanket to put him in? And I said, well, you know, I just threw out an old blanket the other day, and it's down in the rag container in the basement. And my son, my 10-year-old son said, See, Mom, God foreordained that. <laughs> now, okay, now my jaw drops. <laughs> But you see, he didn't make that connection in a vacuum. He had to be taught that God is provident over all things and God foreordained things. And then when the time is right, when the time was right, God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, made that connection in his mind. But the truth 
was taught first, and then God brought the understanding and the connection. So, as a child moves then through the elementary years, their minds will begin to make more and more of these connections as they analyze and organize the information they are being taught. And as they dig deeper into the scriptures, students will become more personally challenged to read and to, to, by what they read and discover. After all, it's not just information anymore because biblical truth demands a response. You have to come to grips with God's truth, either in belief, indifference, or unbelief. And that's where the last stage of learning comes in, the stage in which the students begin to make conclusions based on the information and facts that he has learned and then gives expression to these conclusions. Now, this should be a biblically guided expression and not simply, what do I feel about this? Our expression should be guided by asking, what is God saying in this truth? And how does he call me to respond? So a child now has been presented with biblical truth, such as the Bible says God is sovereign ruler of the universe. The Bible says that I am totally dependent on him and I'm under his authority. The Bible says that I have been created for his glory. The Bible says that I have sin and fall short of his glory. The Bible says that God sent his holy, righteous, and son into the world in order to redeem sinners like me. The Bible calls me to repent and to believe in Jesus that I might be saved and walk in newness of life. Will I submit my mind and my heart to these truths? So as you look through and evaluate the resources you use for your children, here are some things to consider. Do you see a careful precept by precept approach? Do you see the building blocks for big truths being laid in the nursery and preschool years? Are your elementary children being given a bigger and more complex vocabulary for God and his purposes? Have they been given enough biblical truth so they can not only recall the information but organize it logically in their minds and see the big picture of the Bible? Can they summarize the main message of the Bible? And finally, as they progress, are they being more and more challenged to personally respond to and apply the truths they have learned and give expression to them? Hi, my name is Molly Johnson, and I've spent approximately 24 years of my life in children's ministry at Bethlehem, mostly in preschool. So finger plays are a very familiar thing to me. So the following is familiar to me, and I, if I think of you as three and four-year-olds, I'll be a lot more comfortable up here. <laughs> so just follow me. Many children went to see Jesus. Some children walked, some children ran, and some children skipped. All the children clapped their hands. They were happy to see Jesus. All these years of ministry were not hard. My labor had been shared with my dear friend and my partner in ministry, Mary Pearson, until the last year and a half in preschool ministry when Mary got sick with leukemia. Then her ministry changed from teaching to praying for every one of the children in our class every Saturday night by name. Those who followed Mary's journey through her Caring Bridge site were blessed by the Old Testament key themes that Mary had been teaching for years. God knows everything. God is all powerful. God is faithful. God is merciful. God is holy. Nothing is too hard for God. God is sovereign. 
the deep truths of God and his character that are taught in preschool were sufficient to keep the flames from consuming and the rivers from overwhelming Mary in the suffering she passed through. I am so thankful to have had these years of ministry with Mary, and I would like to take this opportunity to encourage all of you to minister long term. And if you can find a partner to minister with, you will be blessed, and it will not be hard. To see children who pass through my class graduating from college, getting married, and best of all, walking with the Lord, is to see Bethlehem's vision for ministry to children become reality. Though this year I have passed the baton of preschool ministry over to another to join a different ministry, God has given me joyful endurance to run the race and encouragement to keep running year after year. I look forward to seeing the youngest children in 20 years. I expect to see the seeds of faith that were planted and watered in preschool one Sunday school growing into strong young oaks of righteousness. Toward the end of each school year, Mary would say to me, unless God calls me somewhere else or someone tells me it's time to move on, I will be back to teach again next year. And I would say, if you come back, I will come back. Well, almost one year ago, God did call Mary somewhere else. And I can only imagine how happy she was to see Jesus. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you that there is henceforth laid up for us a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only me, but also all who have loved your appearing. Lord Jesus, we love your appearing. We anticipate it. And I pray, Lord, that you would grant that through this labor of sitting here and slogging through these crucial concepts, that the fruit, Lord, would be more in generations to come who love that appearing. And so, Lord, fill us with hope and fill our children with this hope and give us, Lord, increased confidence in you as we seek to raise up this generation to put their trust and their confidence in you. We ask it in Jesus' matchless name. Amen.